We're going to look this evening at a verse that we find in the book of Zephaniah. I don't know what you know about Zephaniah, probably not as much as you know about some of the other prophets and great characters of the Word of God, but Zephaniah was a prophet of God who lived and prophesied and ministered in the land of Judah in the reign of King Josiah. It's thought that his ministry was exercised in the years 625 to 630 before Christ. So there we are, that's Zephaniah. He had some fearsome things to say to the people of his time, threatening the judgment of God upon a, a nation that had turned away from the Lord, that had ignored all that God had said through Zephaniah and through other prophets, even in the time of Reformation, which Josiah the king had uh, introduced into the land, there was a great deal of sin, a great deal of rebellion, and of course, looking across the world, wider world, there was a great deal of ungodliness spread across all of the earth. And through Zephaniah, as through many of the other prophets, God warns the ungodly that although they have, as it were, got away with it so far, they can't get away with it for much longer because God is going to come down with his judgment. But amongst all of the unbelievers there in Jerusalem or in, in Judah are some godly people, people who know the Lord and walk with the Lord and love the Lord. And amidst all of these threatenings of judgment, God comes to them and speaks to them in wonderfully comforting and helpful and encouraging ways. And the chief way that he speaks is in this verse 17 of chapter 3. That's what we're going to fix our thoughts upon tonight. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And there's a verse, therefore, that speaks about God's great joy or delight over his believing people. When God looks upon the world at large, he sees sin and rebellion, law-breaking and all the rest. But when God looks upon his trusting, obedient people, he takes great delight and joy in them. And the question that's asked of us right at the beginning of the message tonight is where do we stand in all of this? Are we amongst the world upon whom the judgment of God one day is going to fall? God does know what we do. He knows what we think. He knows how we are. And the judgment of God will come one day sooner or later. Are we there? Or are we among the believers, the people of God in whom God takes great delight and over whom the Lord rejoices. Well, I'm going to divide the, the message tonight up into two main parts. First of all, the first part is divided into two. Two facts about God, elementary things that we need to be reminded about. These people did, and so do we. Two facts about the believer's God, and four facts, secondly, about God's love and delight in his people. Two facts then about the believer's God. You notice at the beginning of the verse, we're told, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Well, just before we come to those two things, let me repeat in a way what I've already said. The Lord thy God. Now, in one sense, of course, God is everybody's God. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the creator of heaven and the earth. He is the sovereign Lord who rules over all. And whether people like it or not, he is God. And he is our God because he made us, put us into his world, and he rules over all things. We can deny it, but he is still God. He is our maker and he is our judge. But to believers, he is our God in a very different sense altogether. And we'll think about that 
a little bit later on, but surely that's how we want him to be our God, not simply be to be our creator and our judge, but to be the God of a believer, this God in a special relationship with us. Well, is he thy God in that sense? But if he is, here's one truth, one fact about him, he is in the midst of thee. God among his people, God with his people. God is with his people in a very personal and special way. God is with his people in their hearts, in their lives, in all of our experiences, in our joys and in our sorrows. He's with us in our homes, in our lives, as we meet together. God is among us in that sense. God is especially among his people in the church and as the church meets for her services of worship and her other meetings. That's what Christ promised. You remember that, of course. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. Think of that tonight. We're met together, not in our name, not in the name of the church, but in the name of the head of the church, Christ. And therefore, Christ, having promised to be amongst us, <clears throat> is here by his Spirit. It's the truth, it's the fact. It's what he's promised, and what he promises he will do not, not deny us. He doesn't say things that he doesn't mean and give, uh, give uh, assurances that he doesn't intend to fulfill. Christ is here. Why? He's the Saviour. He wants to come and to meet with us that his own believing people may be comforted and encouraged and taught. And if we're not his, he would come and meet us in order to make us his, to convert us and to bring us faith to faith. Christ in the midst of his people, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee. Let us be reverent, let us be humble, thinking that God is among us even tonight. But here's a thought, this is where God delights to be, especially as his church meets together for worship. This is the God who in the Old Testament says that he is the one who inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, when praise is offered to God, there he delights to be, to receive, to hear, to respond to the praise that we bring to his great and holy name. He delights to be here. It's his free choice. No one has persuaded him or forced him to make the promises that he's made. He doesn't come because some ulterior or superior power um, compels him to come. He doesn't come because we need to persuade him to come. It's his promise freely made and that promise is freely kept. He delights to be with us when we worship together. What a God this is, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee. Well, what about him? He's mighty. That's what the verse says. We surely know about this great truth. It sounds out from the scriptures right from the beginning to the end. The God of infinite power who spoke and brought the worlds into being the God who one day will wind it all up and introduce the new heavens and the new earth. You ask what kind of power God has got, it's that kind of power. Unlimited power, infinite power. God that can speak and all his will is brought into, into being. The God who in this very book speaks about bringing down his enemies. Who can withstand that power? Who can overturn his great decrees and his, and his will? But in the midst of his people, there he is to care for them, to protect them, to provide for them, to accomplish all his wise and loving purposes for them and among them. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. What a word and what a message to go forth into the week with. What are we going to meet? What's going to happen to us? What are our experiences are going to be? What kind of problems we, might we face? What might, kind of decisions do we have to make? What kind of needs are we going to face up to? Well, here's a thought. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. It's a wonderful message for a local church, isn't it? A small local church, but the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. 
There aren't many large churches around in our country today. Most of them are small, particularly the ones that seek to remain faithful to the Word of God. But what an encouragement. If God is our God, which is what we believe Him to be, and if He's in the midst of us, which He's promised to be, then who knows what will happen? Who knows what could happen tonight? Who knows what might happen next Lord's Day morning or next Lord's Day day evening? We might, for all I know, have a queue of people at the door of the church. If that's the case, then I'll write to every one of you visitors here tonight and let you know what's going on. What a thing that would be. But who knows, you see? The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Who knows what answers to prayer we might see in the coming week? Prayers that we've offered for years and almost given up on. It seems that we repeat them almost parrot fashion every day because there they are, they're upon our hearts, we bring them to God, we see nothing happening and we wonder whether ever God is going to respond to that prayer. But the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Who knows what and when God might do. So two wonderful facts about the believer's God. Who'd want to go through life without a God of that kind? A God who's with us and a God who is so mighty to care, to provide, and to protect. But the verse comes to a kind of crescendo now. You know how in, in music you have a crescendo, it builds to a pitch. There are some composers, I'm talking about the classical music world now, some composers that, that have a <coughs> particular gift for, for writing and composing their music and and, and the whole thing builds up to a mighty climax. And that's what you've got here, I think, in, verse, in this verse in, in Zephaniah, Zephaniah 3, verse 17. As we think about the love and the goodness of God, it builds up into a tremendous climax at the end of it. I'll show you what, you mean when, what I mean when we get there. But they say, don't they, that fact is stranger than fiction. Some things happen in this world that you would never invent. You'd never dream of it. But they happen and it's real life. Well, there are certain things that we read of in the Word of God that we would never, ever invent. They, are, they would, to, to our mortal minds, seem so far-fetched that we would never believe them were it not for the fact that they're not inventions of our mind we read them in black and white in the Word of God, put there by inspiration of the Lord himself. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, he will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. This is the believer's God. This is the delight and the joy, the love of God toward and in his people. Well, there are four obvious things to think about there. First of all, he will save. In what way? Well, you have to begin with salvation from sin because if you don't begin there, you can't go any further. It all begins there in your spiritual pilgrimage and in mine and in everybody's. This is the greatest, most important, essential, vital thing that anybody who ever lived in the world could possibly have, to be saved from sin. Unless we're saved from sin, we are under God's wrath and under con God's condemnation, and we cannot rightly expect any good thing from God's hand. We can't. And so this is, the, this is where we start. He will save. And praise God, when God says he will save, he will save. What must I do to, believe, believe, to be saved? Said the jailer to Paul, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This is a salvation that is definite, not wishful thinking, not mere hopes, not mere schemes that men have invented that might do good, that might lead us to God, that might deal with the sin of our hearts. This is definite. He will save. Who will he save? Well, it's not in the verse here per se, but it's in the scriptures all the way through. He will save those who come to him in his way and in his terms. Repentance, confession of sin, believing in Christ, come to him like that, 
He'll save you. No doubt about it. He'll release you from your condemnation. He'll acquit you from all of your sin. He'll put the righteousness of his own son upon you. And you'll not be condemned. You'll not have to fear the judgment. You'll not have to live in fear and dread of hell. You'll live in expectation of heaven. He will save you. He will save. He will save all who come to him by Jesus Christ. Saved by the blood of Christ. The great cost that Jesus Christ paid there at Calvary's cross. He's done everything for the salvation of sinners just like we are. And he will save all who come to God therefore in response to his call. He will save from death. He will save from hell. And we're to trust him for it. Don't try and work for it. Trust him for it. And he will save your soul. We could go on with this because having saved us from sin, he will save us from all kinds of things. If we start to live in his way, he will save us from untold calamity and disaster and misery and unhappiness because left to ourselves, who knows what we would do? Who knows where we would go? Who knows what kind of lives we would live and the kind of mistakes we might make? We would go blundering our way through one catastrophe after the other. But he will save us from all of that because having saved us from sin and brought us to the point where we trust him for salvation, he brings us to the point where we trust him to guide us, to lead us, to show us the way in which he would have us to go. And when we're walking in his way, we will be saved from all manner of things that otherwise might come our way. This is our God. He will save. What else? The climax is building, the crescendo is coming, the full orchestra is beginning to, to join in to the, to the theme of this. He will rejoice over thee with joy. Now this is where it begins to, to get especially wonderful in my view. He will rejoice over thee with joy. Now having been saved, it is almost inevitable that we rejoice over him because of what he has done for us. We may well rejoice with joy over our salvation, our newfound condition, whereby we're not condemned, but we are justified. And there's a cause to rejoice. We rejoice with joy over the fact that that's now true of us. God's judgment does not hang over us like some sword of Damocles anymore. Rather, God's blessing is upon us in terms of our salvation and release from all of that and we stand acquitted, we stand justified and certain of it and we rejoice over that. Nothing more to fear from God but every blessing to expect from his most gracious hand. We may well rejoice over our new life, so different, so much better, led by God, provided by God, living with all the promises of God, being fulfilled in our lives day after day. We may well rejoice over our new future, a new future in this world and a new future in eternity. There's a cause to rejoice, to rejoice over all that Christ has purchased for us. It's a theme on its own, isn't it? The joys of heaven, that which we're rightly led to expect when we leave this world and go into the next. There's a cause to rejoice. Shame upon us that we hesitate, that we kind of recoil from thinking about it too much. We say, well, oh, I'm looking forward to heaven, but you know, I've got quite a bit to get on with in this life first. Quite a few pleasures to to enjoy and um, I'm looking forward to heaven but I do hope it won't be quite yet. Well, really we have got a gross misconception of what heaven is, if, if that's how we think but it's, it's the honest truth, isn't it? We, we, we really are like that. We, we shy away from these things but the truth be known, we should be rejoicing that heaven is waiting for us and we should echo the words toward the end of the book of the Revelation, even so, come Lord Jesus. 
And let us enter into the joy of our Lord, as we've read there in Matthew 25. And best of all, of course, we rejoice over our Saviour. If it wasn't for him, none of these things would be true. We'd have nothing to rejoice about, really. Few things in this life, for a few short years, and then it's all gone, it's all behind us, and then what? Dreadful, dreadful, unspeakable, indescribable misery that awaits those who die without a saviour. But once we come to know him, we rejoice in him, we rejoice over him, all his goodness and mercy to us, so faithful, so good, rejoicing that he ever thought of us, that ever he loved us, that ever he was willing to come into the world and die for our sins. So we may well rejoice over him, but could we ever expect to read these words, that he rejoices over us with joy? Now how can that possibly be? How can we possibly bring joy to him? Well, the answer to that question is really that his grace, his kindness and goodness to us has now got us where he has always wanted us to be. That's the answer to it. You know, this is the, the teaching of the word of God, isn't it? That God has known us and has had his love upon us from everlasting, from ever before there was a world from before there were even angels, when there was only God dwelling as the Spirit who subsequently called into being the heavens and the earth. In eternity, he has known us and loved us and planned our salvation for us. And when we were born in our sin, he waited for the day of his appointing when he would bring us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happened, God has us where he always wanted us to be, as believers in Jesus Christ, as sons and daughters of the living God. And he rejoices over the fact that we're now saved, that we're now justified. He rejoices over the fact that he can look upon us and see our faith and see our love for him he rejoices when he looks upon us that he can see very faintly the image of his own dear son in us because that's what begins to happen when we're Christians. He begins to change us and to form us into the image of Christ and we can't see very much of it at times but it's there. He's recovering us and changing us and little by little this morning again the fruit of the Spirit the graces of Christ are all being formed in us and God looks down with joy and delight. Look at that one. Look at my believer over there. Look at my son. Look at my daughter. See what they were and see what they are. See what my grace has done. See what Christ has done. See what my spirit is doing. And he rejoices to see the outworking of his everlasting love and of his gracious purposes. He rejoices in our communion with him when we come to him in prayer, when we come to his word. Look at this child of mine, coming to my word, calling upon me in prayer. Oh, this is what I've saved them to do. This is why I've brought them to faith, that they might engage in this communion and fellowship with me. This is why he made man. Adam, Eve in the garden, God coming down to walk in the cool of the day. Adam, where art thou? They were used to see to fellowship one with another. This is how it's meant to be. This is how it's going to be in heaven. But when God looks down upon us even while we're on earth and he sees us holding fellowship with him and seeking his face, it brings joy to his heart. It's the outworking of his great purposes that he knew even from before the world was. He sees us struggling against our sin, fighting, trying to get on top of it, trying to labour for him and to serve for him and we don't do very well at it but he takes delight in the fact that we are doing what we do helped by his spirit this is the joy of the Lord he rejoices over thee with joy and he rejoices over the fact that one day 
he will take us to be with him forever. To release us from the trials of life and to speak to us as he, the Lord speaks to those servants there. The first two servants with the five talents, the two talents in Matthew 25. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, that joyful place that is heaven. Come on. Come and enter into the joy of thy Lord. The Lord rejoices over thee with joy. Third thing, he will rest in his love. Well, this could mean a number of different things. Um, different commentators, different preachers over the years have drawn out all kinds of different aspects of what this can and no doubt does mean. But let's just dwell on one because time is fast going. You know that when, right at the beginning, we're told in Genesis, the, the account of creation, that God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. That was on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And I think that that's a way to look at this verse. After all that love has planned, after all that love has laboured for in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, in all of the wrestlings of God the Holy Spirit to bring us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has done all of that to bring us to believe, to bring us to the state and condition of salvation. And having done all of that, he rests. And he rests in his love that designed and accomplished the great plan of salvation. Can you imagine what that really means? This infinite, almighty, everlasting, all holy God has in love desired your and my salvation. And he has worked, as it were, and planned and schemed to accomplish all of this. And he's brought us to faith and then, I speak with reverence, he sits back just as he did when, when he created the heavens and the earth and says, now that is very good. This is what I designed to happen. This is what my heart wanted to happen. And now I can rest because my beloved people are here in faith and in union with my beloved son and they're mine and they're mine forever. What a thing. You wouldn't dream it, would you? You wouldn't dare to say such things if we didn't have the warrant for them in the scriptures, but we do. Think of it. Think of it, Christian friend, tonight. God over you rests in his love. Think of it if you're not a believer. Come to faith in Christ, and God will have accomplished all that he designed for you, and he will rest in his love for you. Well, now we've got the brass coming in. The full orchestra is going full works because the, the crescendo has come to a real pitch. He will joy over thee with singing. Why do we sing? Why do people feel the, the impulse to sing? I mean to say they do it in football grounds, don't they? You hear people going down the street sometimes and they're singing. Why do we do that? Well, we sing because it gives vent to our emotions, to our feelings. Why do we sing in church? Well, we might say, well, it gives vent to our spiritual emotions and our spiritual feelings. Well, there are more noble reasons than we, for our doing it than that. We, have, we sing in church because we're told to sing in church because of the scriptures. We only do what in church what the scriptures tell us to do. We don't do anything else. We don't do anything less, we don't do any, anything more. But we sing to God in worship because we've got all kinds of examples of it. We have David, the type of Christ, who was the sweet psalmist of Israel. We read that singers were appointed in temple worship. We read that Christ sang psalms with his disciples before his crucifixion. We read what Paul says in Ephesians 5, whereby we are to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And those are the reasons that we sing to God in our worship, because he tells us to. 
But I wonder whether in this part of the verse we've got an extra kind of hidden warrant for singing. And we have an explanation in a sense why David and why Christ sang psalms and so forth in their time. It's because God sings. Now this may well be, and of course it really is, what we call an anthropomorphism, a kind of a, an expression of, 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 uh, whereby God accommodates himself to us. You know, the infinite spiritual God who accommodates himself to us and describes himself in a way that we can understand. But for God to express himself as being a God who sings, is quite remarkable. He will joy over thee with singing. Does that mean then that God has such joy in his heart that he bursts into song over his people? That's the sense of the verse. And what it surely means is this, that God's heart is full of joy. This is not some partial thing, it's not something that is conjured up. We have a God in heaven whose love is so profound and intense for his people that having brought us to faith in Christ and united to us, him, us to himself through that blood shed upon Calvary, all of the plan of salvation finally worked out. The heart of God over his people is so full that, that, that the God of heaven bursts into song at the, at the thought of it. What a thing. You see what I mean by a crescendo, by the climax, by the pitch to which this verse has brought us. You know, the scriptures speak about music in heaven, the new song that is sung, the sound of many waters, that, that voice, that expression of the redeemed in heaven above. But it suggests to us when you read a verse like this that there is one voice that is louder than all the rest all the rest put together. The countless legions of angels and all the redeemed of God, yes, they sing before the throne of God. But the voice of God that comes from the throne exceeds it all. And why? Because his grace has brought the likes of you and me to that very place. He rejoices over thee with singing. How we underestimate the love and the goodness of Almighty God. How much injustice we do to him in thinking of him as being austere and demanding and overbearing and all the rest of it. Oh, he's not like that. He's full of grace and kindness and compassion and he draws us to his son. He puts faith into our hearts. He saves our souls from hell. He brings us into his heaven and he rejoices over us even with singing. That's our God. That's the heart of our God. That's the love of our God. Do we have any understanding of this? Do we have even a glimpse of what this really means? Well, one day, surely, this is the very nature of the new song in heaven, when we realise, to a fuller extent, the goodness of God toward us and the joy of the Lord over us, then it'll be a new song indeed, won't it? As for all of us, surely, we must say we can't wait to learn those words, to learn that tune, and to sing it from our hearts. What love, what goodness, what grace is upon his people. My friends, if you're not among these people over whom rejoices yet, then come and believe upon him without delay and know the joy of the Lord for yourself.